Hi, I'm Brandon Gleason. I'm a mechanical engineer at Woodward Incorporated in Fort Collins, Colorado, USA. The title of my presentation today is Improved Prediction of Butterfly Valve Aerodynamic Torque Through CFD, Commercial Code, and SU2 Evaluation. I'll start by giving a brief introduction to Woodward Incorporated and also an overview of the glow tick to butterfly valve that is the subject of this study. And then I'll jump into uh, aerodynamic uh, torque test data that was collected on this particular valve and serves as the uh, basis for this comparative study of different CFD codes. And when I talk about aerodynamic torque, what I'm referring to is in this case of a butterfly uh, plate valve, um, when that plate is moved to a certain position in the flow field, uh, depending on the pressure conditions, it will generate a resultant aerodynamic torque um, that usually wants to try to close the plate um, towards the straight up and down position in this orientation being shown here on this slide. Um, so this is an important effect that we uh, try to understand. Um, and then I'll touch a little bit more on, on why in an upcoming slide. Uh, and then I'm going to talk briefly about an empirical model that we've used uh, in the past for cases where we don't have good test data for certain conditions. Um, and this model tries to predict that aerodynamic torque, but it, as we'll see, it sort of drove motivation to explore uh, CFD as an alternative method. And so when we get into the CFD study, um, I'll first talk about some general strategy uh, aspects and then talk a little bit about the grid strategy that was used. Um, and then talk about our setup in ANSYS CFX and SU2 following that. And then close with some comparative visualizations and comments and then touch on future work. So Woodward Incorporated, uh, it was founded in 1870. Uh, we're celebrating our 150th anniversary this summer, which is exciting. Uh, our first product was a water wheel governor, a model of which is shown in the middle of the slide here. Um, but today we've grown into an uh, international company. We're a leading supplier of various aerospace and industrial control products. And one of those products is the Glowtech 2 uh, butterfly valve shown here. It's uh, an exhaust control valve. Um, it's actually a family of different valve sizes with bore diameters that range from 40 to 150 millimeters. And it's used primarily on uh, marine uh, propulsion, um, so for engines powering uh, cruise ships and such, uh, and also on power generation engines to help control the flow of exhaust. And it is paired with the Woodward R-Series uh, geared actuator. Um, and so the ability then to model the valve torque is critical to sizing the actuator that we couple with the valve so that we can provide the customer a, com a complete solution that's going to work at their particular flow conditions. So that's really the motivation for uh, trying to understand the aerodynamic uh, torque that acts on the butterfly plate. And then as we'll see, this study evaluated CFD for improving our aerodynamic torque prediction over an empirical textbook equation. And the specific CFD packages, as I alluded to, um, for this study was ANSYS CFX and SU2. So uh, the aero torque test data that we generated, uh, which serves as the basis for the study, uh, was generated on the compressible flow test stand at the Loveland, Colorado Woodward, Woodward facility. Uh, and we ran a range of inlet and outlet pressures across different valve angles to generate a aerodynamic torque map of the valve. And we covered both transonic and subsonic conditions um, to represent a wide design space of conditions that the valve will see in the field. Um, but we observed that some test points uh, exceed the flow stand uh, capacity. And especially when we start testing larger valves and then more so at the higher valve angles where there, there's um, higher flow rates, um, we just don't have the air capacity to hit all the test points that we want. So that drives the need um, for some type of a modeling 
uh, approach to be able to um, get a prediction and prediction of, uh, of the valve performance at, at the, the, those points. Um, so for this study, I focused on the 80 millimeter version of the Glotec 2 valve um, as kind of a, a midpoint size where we did have a lot of good test data, but um, we also had the need to extend to uh, other flow regimes that we weren't able to replicate on the flow stand. So this was kind of a, a two-step approach. Um, step one being um, trying to build confidence in a CFD model by re replicating the conditions we were able to generate on the flow stand. So make sure we have good agreement with test data. Um, and then step two um, can then be uh, opened up to uh, uh, you know extended flow conditions where uh, we want to model maybe a, a new a customer that has a new application at at higher pressures or different temperatures. Um, we would then have confidence to be able to use CFD to predict the valve performance in those situations. This is a photo of our test setup. Uh, so our air tanks um, are not shown in the photo. They're behind this wall to the right. And then we have an inlet uh, control valve system uh, back there as well. And then the flow is brought in through a portal in this wall. Um, we have an inlet temperature sensor there. And then the air is brought to the test fixture through this flexible hose, which then connects to our inlet uh, pipe section. And I'll talk a little bit more about uh, this sudden expansion that occurs here between the hose and the pipe because that becomes important. And then a little bit upstream of the valve, we have an inlet uh, pressure sensor probe array that measures our inlet static pressure. And then the, the test valve um, is located in the middle here. And then it's coupled to a uh, position encoder so that we can uh, accurately set the valve to uh, particular valve angles that we're interested in testing. And then we have a torque transducer uh, to continuously monitor the aerodynamic torque that's being generated on the plate at the various flow conditions and valve positions. And then on the outlet side, um, again, we have an array of pressure probes. Um, for measuring the outlet pressure, and then we have a back pressure control or a P2 control valve. And so from that test stand, um, we can generate uh, curves of aerodynamic torque, so that's the x uh, the y-axis, excuse me, um, versus valve angle on the x-axis. Um, and so for this particular curve, uh, these were transonic conditions where the inlet pressure was controlled to 40 psi, and the outlet pressure was held to 16 PSI, um, with the notable exception that once we reached 65 degree of valve angle, uh, we were having a little bit uh, of trouble controlling the, those pressures on the, the test stand. Um, so we ran a second point uh, by just increasing the outlet pressure a little bit to increase the stability of the, of the system. So that's point A. So that represents a 18 PSI outlet point, which we then held for point B at 70 degrees. And then as we increased to our final point, uh, point C at 75 degrees, we had to make a further increase to back pressure um, to 19 PSI. The subsonic conditions uh, that we used for this study were an inlet pressure of 62 and a half PSI and an outlet pressure of 50 PSI. And that generated uh, this torque curve on the right. And I'll mention for clarity that a zero degree valve angle represents the plate in the closed position. So the low flow condition for the valve. And then it opens up towards um, 80, 85 degrees for a maximum flow point uh, at, the, at the upper end of the valve range. And so as you probably noticed in that curve, um, there are error bars associated with the angle and the torque um, for each uh, test point. And the reason for that is um, the way we record the aero torque data during the test. Um, so we build the test valves for this test with special rolling element bearings um, to try to minimize the influence of friction torque um, to our measurement. Um, so we're really interested in only going after the aerodynamic torque. Um, so to further minimize frictional torque, um, in addition to using rolling element bearings, we also dither the valve back and forth about a degree uh, 
um, in order to keep the bearings in a state of uh, kinetic friction instead of static friction. And so that produces um, a data set um, from one of the points. This is from a 55 degree valve angle point during the transonic flow conditions. Um, you can see our, our dithering angle varies here on the x-axis. And then on the y-axis is our uh, continuous arrow torque measurement with our high-speed data acquisition system. And you can see it generates uh, kind of a hysteresis loop of, uh, uh, of scattering of, of torque data versus angle. And so our, our final result that we report is really the mean of the angle uh, and the mean torque that was measured from this um, array of data. Uh, but then it's also expressed with these error bars that represent plus or minus uh, three standard deviations, plus or minus three sigma for uh, valve angle and torque. So the empirical model um, is an equation that is uh, very convenient to use uh, for predicting aerodynamic torque on a generic butterfly valve. Uh, it's equation 3.3-24 from Anderson's text uh, entitled The Analysis and Design of pneumatic systems. And so this is an equation that we have used for a number of years um, for situations where we don't have good test data to represent um, the flow conditions that we're interested in. Um, but what we noted from testing the GLOTEC 2 valve is that this model is not a very good uh, predictor of aerodynamic torque. Um, in this situation. So the blue line was the test data I showed in the previous slides, but now we've added the empirical model prediction for aerodynamic torque um, for both the transonic case on the left and the subsonic case on the right. And we can see it's just not a great agreement. If we dive into that a little deeper, uh, of course we see that it's over predicting torque for the transonic case. Uh, but conversely, it's under predicting torque for the subsonic case. So that's an interesting observation. Also note that it's insensitive to the downstream pressure changes that we had to invoke at the 65 degree point um, for the transonic case. So we noted that when we increased that outlet pressure from 16 PSI to 18 PSI, we saw a jump in torque. Well, the empirical model doesn't actually see that as a difference in torque. Um, and the reason is that the model is essentially assuming a kind of choked torque condition, if you will, similar to like you would think of uh, choked mass flow behaving, whereas the torque is, is insensitive to downstream pressure changes once the flow has exceeded Mach 1. Uh, but that's not the case that we see in the actual test data. Um, the empirical model also always predicts peak torque to occur at 65 degrees, um, but we see that's not the case here. And my theory is that the, the poor agreement here is likely due to the unique topology of the GLOTEC 2 valve plate, which I'm showing here in, in this bottom image. So uh, my theory is that the empirical model was built around um, probably a simple disc plate style butterfly valve whereas our plate has uh, more of a third dimension to it for uh, structural reinforcement, but that very likely uh, changes the aerodynamic profile of the valve plate. So hence we turn then to CFD uh, to try to generate an improved uh, analytical tool for predicting aero torque. Um, so because the plate is symmetrical um, left to right, uh, we were able to leverage half symmetry in our CFD setup. We use RAN's steady compressible flow simulation. Um, for the purpose of comparing SU2 with CFX, uh, I avoided the use of wall functions. And so the grid layers uh, strive for a Y plus of around one, and I'm using 30 boundary layer cells on all the wall surfaces. The pipe walls are modeled as isothermal, and then the boundary condition for the plate walls um, for the butterfly plate are modeled as adiabatic. And a lesson learned from a previous uh, correlation study on the, this flow stand setup is that it's important to include 
the sudden expansion at the inlet from the hose to the pipe transition. And so if you remember back to the photo of the test stand, I'm talking about this transition here, where we go from the flexible hose to the rigid pipe, there's a significant increase in diameter at that point. And at some of the higher uh, flow points, that actually generates um, some shock patterns um, at that transition. But then more importantly, it kind of generates this core jet of, of higher momentum um, that reaches the plate. And in some of the farther open angle points, it does have a profound impact on the torque prediction um, with or without this uh this sudden expansion included so we're better able to replicate the test stand data when we do include the sudden expansion so i've done that in this study uh, and then in this study i focus on plate angles um, at 30 degree valve angle or higher and the grid was generated in ansys workbench uh, early on when I was setting up CFX, um, I did do a grid independence study and I found that about 10 million elements was optimal. Um, originally I, I was using wall functions, uh, so I looked at a uh, different number of inflation layers as sort of a, a different, as an additional input into just pure grid density. Um, but in general found that, uh, you know, right at about 10 million uh, cells was kind of an optimal point for predicting aerodynamic torque accurately um, without undue computational expense. Um, and then through a little bit more mesh refinement by switching some of my pipe sections to an un unstructured hex, uh, I was able to bring that, uh, that element count down uh, a little bit further, which was nice. So this is an example of, uh, of the grid. So showing the unstructured hex uh, in the inlet hose portion um, with uh, with boundary layers and then at the sudden expansion uh, it's a region filled with tets um, and then back to unstructured hex for the straight pipe region and then when the flow is uh, for the flow area around the butterfly plate itself uh, using a little bit higher density uh, tetrahedrons method for the grid generation and then uh, prisms for the the plate wall itself this is a distribution of y, play, uh, y plus on both sides of the plate for one of the high flow uh, conditions. Um, so you can see it was generally able to achieve a Y plus of, uh, of one to one and a half for the majority of, of the plate area. So then specifically for the CFX setup, um, I used a multi-configuration approach. So I used the upwind um, advection setting in CFX, which is their first order uh, numerical scheme for an initialization run. So I would run that for 500 iterations to sort of stabilize the flow field um, and then continue solving from that solution with the high resolution uh, second order advection scheme for uh, an additional 2000 iterations to finish out the, the simulation. I used the Spallart Almaros turbulence model, uh, which can be enabled as a beta feature in CFX. Um, I also like to use the shear stress transport model, um, often for internal flow, uh, but settled on the, uh, the SA model for the comparison with SU2 in this case. Um, and then I stick with first order turbulence uh, models for stability. And then air is modeled as an ideal gas with the Sutherland viscosity model, uh, total energy, and then the final torque results are reported as the mean um, from the final 500 iterations. Um, and then I do look at, again, the plus or minus three sigma results to try to capture any uh, you know, quasi unsteady effects that I may be getting as the solution converges. So now if we update the plot with the results from CFX, which is the green trend line, we note that it's a much better prediction compared to the empirical model. Um, it's a pretty good accurate representation of aero torque across the range from 30 to uh, 75 degrees with the possible exception that at 75 degrees, um, we're just about outside the error bar on the low side compared to the test data. So a little bit of an under prediction in torque there, um, but overall very good for the transonic case. 
Um, similar positive results for the subsonic case, slight over prediction and torque outside the error bars at the, at the peak torque values between 70 and 80 degrees. And then a little bit of an under prediction at 80, but, uh, but, but pretty good overall, certainly better than the empirical model. Um, and then the other key thing is that the CFD model does accurately capture the transonic torque shift at 65 degrees when we increase the pressure from 16 to 18 PSI. So again, going back to this jump that occurred between these two points at 65 degrees, simply by increasing the outlet pressure uh, from 16 to 18 PSI, even though we still stay choked in the traditional sense for mass flow, um, it does change the torque. And so CFX uh, was able to capture that effect as well, where as the, the empirical model didn't, as I discussed. So uh, why then evaluate uh, SU2? Um, well, it's uh, obviously an open source alternative to commercial codes. Um, so in that sense, it's, it's very approachable in that it doesn't cost anything to try it. So um, as an engineer, it's always uh, interesting to go out and try to find new tools to put in your toolbox when you're trying to solve, uh, solve problems. Um, so today, Steady State RANS is, is really still the workhorse for our flow simulations at Woodward. Um, you know, we use, we use these commercial codes and generally, you know, solving RANs, we're able to, to get a result overnight using 32 cores. And that's, that's a pretty good setup for us um, for the simulations we're doing today. Um, but as we look to the future, you know, the question is how can our product design and insight improve as we move towards scale resolve simulations? Um, so in that case, maybe we can find benefits to, you know, better resolving the wake in this butterfly example. Um, so in that case, maybe 32 cores doesn't cut it. We need to go to, you know, possibly hundreds or thousands of cores. And so in that, at that point, um, you know, what happens to the commercial license costs that traditionally scale with processor count? It's kind of the, one of the concerns. Um, so that's, sort of an enticing aspect of, of SU2 would be the, you know, the freedom from, from such uh, license structures as that. And then the ability to, you know, jump into the code to try to, you know, you need to understand exactly what's going on under the hood for a particular solver. You know, the code is open and right there. If you need to change something, it's all open source. So that, that's a nice um, ability to have as well. And then specifically some points of interest um, for SU2, um, from my perspective, the fact that it's a, a density based solver is, is huge. Um, having adjoint capabilities is great. There were nice solver improvements um, implemented in version seven. Uh, the finite element method, uh, discontinuous Galerkin capability is interesting to me. I haven't tried that yet, but um, I'm interested to do so. Uh, seems to be a very positive active development community. Uh, the documentation keeps improving and there's good, good tutorials available on the web. So back to this problem, um, running SU2, uh, I, I used version 7.0.0 um, and I used the same grids that I used for the CFX runs. Um, and since both codes are node-based, that, uh, that makes for a nice valid uh, apples to apples comparison between the codes. Uh, allowed for 6,000 iterations. I used the Spilar Almaris turbulence model again. Uh, I turned on CFL adaption um, from five to 30 with 50, uh, 50 linear solver max iterations with a 1E minus three tolerance. Green Gauss for gradient and reconstruction. Uh, second order with Vin Kartikrishnan weighing slope limiter, uh, but stuck with first order turbulence as I did in CFX. Um, in this case, lift the limiter off. And then for the convective numerical method used, um, I used SLOW2 was what I settled on. I tried a number of the different offerings in SU2 and found this one to have a nice combination of uh, stability and low dissipation. So this, uh, this ended up being my preferred setup for that. Uh, I did not use multi-grid, uh, did not turn on low mock preconditioning. Used the Sutherland viscosity model and the constant uh, Prandtl thermal conductivity model.
I want to talk briefly about um, the inlet boundary condition uh, specific to the SU2 setup. So normally I would prefer to use an inlet total pressure boundary condition when I'm doing um, a flow simulation like this because that's usually how um, flow uh, scenarios are, are dictated by our, our goals or our customer setup is through pressure specification. But in this case, because I'm trying to model the effects of the sudden expansion from the test stand, I had to switch to a mass flow inlet. Um, and I ran into a little bit of a challenge um, doing this with SU2. And I'll explain that on the next slide. Um, but first, just kind of an image to reinforce why I had to switch to a mass flow boundary condition. So if you recall back to the photo of the test stand, our inlet pressure probes are fairly close to the valve itself. Um, so there's not a lot of room to, uh, to have like a, a nice long inlet run to let the, the flow fully develop in the CFD domain. Um, and then in addition to that, in my CFD domain, again, I'm capturing that sudden expansion. Um, and so my inlet boundary then ends up being, I think almost uh, two meters upstream of my, what's called my inlet, you know, my inlet pressure. And so I'm not able to just simply take that inlet pressure and apply it to the, to my inlet boundary um, because I do get significant pressure drop, especially once shocks start forming at this sudden expansion. So that's the reason that I had to use a mass flow setup. Um, and then so for that implementation in, in SU2, um, that is specified as a density and a velocity vector at your inlet boundary. And then your temperature and pressure are extracted from the domain. So this works for uh, subsonic inlets, um, which is what we have for this case. So that part was fine. Um, and then you have two options to initialize your, your free stream initialization because that then becomes important because your inlet is going to use this information from the free stream um, to solve for the, uh, the pressures and the temperatures. And so you can initialize a free field with the temperature free stream, which means that the free stream density is calculated from pressure and temperature, or you can elect to initialize the density free stream, which means the temperature of the free stream is calculated from the density and the pressure. Um, but either way, what I found in this setup case for this internal flow problem is that to satisfy the inlet boundary, the free stream initial conditions needed to reflect the inlet hose region at the final solution in order to, to be accurate for the torque prediction. And so I didn't know this um, explicitly from our test setup. From the, from the flow test, I know my free stream temperature, if you will, I know the inlet temperature, but I don't know the inlet, the true inlet pressure at the inlet of my domain because of that sudden expansion. I don't know the velocity there. Um, and thus I don't know my inlet density. So I, in other words, I have to guess at my inlet pressure to calculate my inlet density. Um, so for this study to get around this, um, I just simply solved for the CFX, for the points in CFX first, and then t extracted the, uh, the solution temperature and pressure at the inlet hose and use that as my free stream initialization conditions for SU2. And then that allowed me to, uh, you know, have a really robust initial condition that then solved well and, you know, largely matched the, the CFX solution in that regard. Um, but then to, for, to kind of further explore this conundrum um, for cases where you wouldn't necessarily want to run another code first, um, I ran a, a two by two design of experiment of different initialization options where I purposely guessed on a free stream pressure being half a bar too low um, and then half a bar too high, and then use the two uh, temperature density uh, free stream initialization options to see what effect that would have. And so the, those results are shown on this next slide. Um, so we're showing, we're visualizing pressure field with the flow going from left to right. Um, the top one was when my free stream uh, pressure guess was half a bar too low. 
uh, using the temperature free stream initialization method, uh, that result produced a torque value of 1.78 Newton meters. I got the same result um, if I still guessed a half a bar too low on pressure, but use the density free stream initialization. So that didn't have an effect. If I guessed half a bar too high um, and use temperature free stream initialization, the predicted torque was about 2.2 Newton meters. Um, and then similarly, if I used the density free stream initialization, it was also about 2.2 Newton meters. Um, so what, what I observed from this is that if my pressure guess was initially too low, but I had the correct temperature for, of the free stream from my test stand, that as the solve, as the solver progressed, um, it tended to increase the prediction of the inlet pressure leading up to the plate um, to maintain that constant density because my initial guess was too low. And then conversely, when my guess was too high as it tended to predict lower pressures um, to, to maintain that constant density. So um, it, the summary of that little experiment is that a plus or minus half bar guess for my free stream pressure resulted in a plus or minus 0.4 Newton meter uh, torque prediction. Um, which turns out to be about a 22% effect on mean torque. So it, it was significant. Um, there's a negligible difference between initializing from a temperature free stream perspective versus density, um, provided all the free stream properties were coupled in the initial guess. Um, so that part was, was fine. But I guess my, my comment or my, my takeaway from this is that a, you know, a, a nice alternative boundary condition uh, might be a mass flow inlet boundary with a specified temperature. Um, that would be useful for internal flow problems similar to this, um, such as is available in CFX. And there was already a, a CFD online discussion on this topic uh, with a link there shown. But uh, anyway, that little, um, that little issue aside, um, on to the, the torque prediction results for SU2. Um, so now we've added the SU2 results to the same plot in, a, in the purple line shown, and the results are quite good. Um, good agreement with the test data and CFX. Um, a little bit stronger under prediction from SU2 at the higher angle points at the 70 and 75 degree uh, angle conditions. Um, you know, CFX under predicted as well, but SU2 was uh, under predicting a little bit more. Uh, on the subsonic case though, um, results were, very, were also very good and SU2 was very accurate at the, at the peak torque region, um, which, is, which is a very good result. Did a little better job than uh, the CFX setup did for those points. Um, but then again, at the higher valve angles, um, tended to under predict torque a little bit more than uh, CFX. And then another benefit of using CFD to predict aerodynamic torque is that you can also extract the aerodynamic force or the, the drag force on the plate. And that's something the empirical model doesn't give you. Um, and so simply from the code, if you're already getting torque, then uh, you basically for free, you're gonna get resultant forces as well. So um, for our purposes, we take the resultant of the force, say in this orientation in the Y direction, and then the X direction, and then calculate the resultant, which is the bearing normal force. So this can be used uh, in bearing load calculations, um, and then it can also be used as a key input to a frictional torque model. Uh, that you can then combine with the aerodynamic torque model to get a total uh, torque model uh, for your valve, which then again helps you size the appropriate actuator to combine with it. Um, and so for aerodynamic force, um, saw a very good agreement between uh, SU2 and CFX. So we don't have test data um, for this parameter. Uh, we didn't instrument the valve to, to try to measure the, the force on the plate. So this is just a comparison between the two codes. Um, but again, we're looking at the transonic case on the left graph, uh, valve angle versus force. And you can see um, for all points, the two codes uh, are pretty much on top of each other. Um, similarly, pretty good agreement for the subsonic uh, flow conditions as well. So good agreement there.
So we'll uh, look, finish up with some comparative visualizations. Um, so we're looking now at the sudden expansion from the flexible hose to the inlet pipe uh, with uh, CFX on top, SU2 on the bottom, and we're visualizing a Mach number. And so we see very similar uh, shock patterns from that sudden expansion. Um, and then perhaps a little bit of a clear definition of the, uh, you know, the highest velocity regions at that first, first shock region for SU2. Uh, and then maybe a little bit longer propagation downstream in the case of, of CFX, but generally, you know, the patterns are very similar, which you'd, uh, of course, uh, hope and expect to see. Moving downstream to the plate wake, uh, CFX again on top. So we're looking at get flow from uh, left to right still. And then these are the, sh the, uh, the shock patterns that form in the wake. Um, and again, we see very similar general shapes between the, the, two, the two codes. And then the same region, um, now visualizing density gradient um, on a log scale. So a Schlerian type plot. Um, and I think this plot um, kind of shows uh, less dissipation with the, in the SU2 setup compared to the, the CFX, but otherwise the shock patterns again are, are seen to be very similar between the two codes. And then uh, visualizing the pressure distribution on the butterfly plate itself. So this is, this is really where the aerodynamic torque is is calculated from, so this is an important distribution um, for the final result. So we're looking at CFX on the top row um, for the 70 degree transonic point. So this was the point where both codes were under predicting torque, um, SU2 more so than CFX. Um, SU2 on the bottom row, and then the first column is the inlet pressure side of the plate and the middle column is the outlet pressure side of the plate. And so because there was a difference in torque between these two codes, I stared at these plots for quite a while to try to figure out where the differences in torque were manifesting from. And with the general auto scaling um, shown here in, this, in these first two color schemes, I, I really didn't see any obvious differences. The, you know, the pressure, patterns were generally the, the same from what I could tell. It was only when I started messing around with uh, different ranges on the, the color scale, um, so truncating the bottom of the, the color scale at three bar and the upper end at a little over 3.2 bar, um, sort of brought to light this slight difference at the leading edge of the P1 side of the plate. Where for CFX, you can see there's a thin crescent of relatively higher pressure uh, compared to SU2. And I think this explains why we saw a relatively higher torque from CFX um, compared to SU2, but the plate forces were essentially I identical. And that's because in terms of a total force standpoint, this small area doesn't make much difference, but in terms of a torque scenario, it, it, it does because it's essentially at the point where you have the longest moment arm back to the axis of the plate shaft. Um, so differences here will be, uh, will have the strongest effects on the final torque result. So my, my discovery has only taken me so far as to understand that I think this is where the region of difference is. Um, I don't have a good explanation yet as to why that difference manifests. I've tried a lot of different solver settings on the SU2 side and, and haven't been able to, um, to essentially recover the CFX result yet. But if I take a step back and look at the general pressure profile, look at the shock patterns and everything. Um, the two codes are producing very similar results. So conclusions for SU2, um, you know, much improved prediction of course over the empirical model and largely in line with CFX. Uh, generally within the error bars of the, the test data, um, I talked about the exceptions at some of those higher angle points um, where both codes were under predicting a bit. Um, and um, the improved, we did see improved peak torque prediction uh, for the subsonic case for SU2 versus CFX. So that was a positive in that case for SU2. Um, but then of course, both codes, um, it was good to see that they could both predict that torque shift at 65 degrees from that subtle uh, P2 increase from 16 to 18 PSI. Uh, 
Um, and then it was also encouraging to see um, that using the, the SLOW2 uh, numerical scheme, uh, SU2 seems slightly less dissipative uh, than this, the CFX high resolution setup. But either way, both codes um, produce results that are accurate enough for actuator sizing for the valve systems that we use. So uh, in, in, in short, either code uh, is, is certainly better than the empirical result uh, model and uh, certainly acceptable for the accuracy we need to be able to size an actuator to a valve. So uh, looking ahead, um, as I mentioned, CFD can be a reliable tool for aerodynamic torque prediction of a butterfly plate, both at transonic and subsonic conditions. SU2 was shown to compete well with CFX. Um, so a virtual thumbs up to the SU2 development team. Thanks for all your great work. And thank you for making this code available to everyone. Um, further areas of interest for me for SU2 moving forward. Uh, chasing down the high angle torque sensitivities. Uh, I'd like to explore the adjoint capabilities. It would be a, a neat exercise to try to optimize plate geometry to minimize the aerodynamic torque or force. Um, as I alluded to, I'm interested to, at some point, try out the, uh, the finite element discontinuous Galerkin solver. Um, I've never run a flow simulation uh, with the finite element method, so I'd be interested to know what kind of benefits um, can be had by doing that, would be the strengths of the drawbacks versus a finite volume method. Um, and then, you know, as I touched on moving towards scale resolve simulations in the future, you know, what additional insights uh, will we be able to get by uh, resolving some of those unsteady effects with higher accuracy. Thanks for your time uh, watching this presentation.